And I think when I look back, like what I realized, how important hope is in our lives. Mm. And what this whole thing taught me is not only how important it is, we're never powerless. Mm. We can create change. And that's what made me, you know, do this work because I wanted people to see that no matter what, you're never powerless. You can shift things in your life. You can make your life better. And that's kind of what I feel like I really want to do and help people with. That's the most important thing to me. Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather. And in this episode, I am joined by author Anuradha Dayal Gulati to discuss her book, Heal Your Ancestral Roots, Release the Family Patterns That Hold You Back. Anu discusses trauma as an unprocessed story, how emotions are a portal into healing, family energy fields and family constellation work, and the power of hope and grace in freeing yourself from family karma. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. Greeting Rebel Spirits. Before the interview with Anu, I wanted to let you know about a couple of upcoming events. First, I will be presenting again during this year's Rebecoming the One Symposium. I was really honored to participate last year where I offered a presentation on witches, science, and the inquisition of nature. This year, my presentation is on the divine masculine and is titled The Call of the Diamond, Tending the Wild Genius. The presentation will go live on June 12th, that's 2023. Uh, I'll also be participating in a live panel discussion on the sacred masculine for the symposium. In conjunction with this, I will also be offering a paid workshop on Tending the Wild Genius. The workshop is scheduled for Friday, June 16th. For more information on the Rebecoming the One Symposium, go to livingtheonelight.teachable.com. I also wanted to let you know that the second episode of Cocktail Apocalypse will live stream at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on Saturday, May 13th. Stephanie Bidet and Jeremy Anderson will join me again for another round of All Things Apocalypse. In this episode, we'll be discussing the Book of Revelation, and once again, Jeremy will offer a special drink recipe designed to get you through the end times. So I hope that you can join us. Again, that's 11 a.m. Pacific on Saturday, May 13th. And now, my conversation with Anu Dayal Gulati about her book, Heal Your Ancestral Roots. Anuradha Dayal Gulati is an energy practitioner and transformational coach with a PhD in economics. After 15 years in finance and academia, she began a new path of helping people release the past and reclaim their power. Trained in flower essence therapy and family constellation therapy, she lives in Boston, Massachusetts. She joins me today to discuss her book, Heal Your Ancestral Roots, Release the Family Patterns That Hold You Back. Anu, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking forward to speaking with you. In large part, I enjoyed enjoyed your book, but also I've been working with my ancestors for a while now and exploring the wounds of family trauma, both kind of immediate family trauma, but also going back generations and for my family, I think this also relates to a national level. So I'm really interested in speaking with you. And I, I, I want to ask you about the ancestors and ancestral trauma. But first, just a little bit of personal information. I, I, I was curious if you could share what led you to this path out of finance and academia to working with ancestors and flower essences and family constellation therapy? I think, I think Nick, at some level, it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it, when it did happen, it happened in the most unexpected and also traumatic way. 
because I had a I had a health problem mm. and I had to go into the ER. And you know how you think like this happened, I'm gonna get on with my life, it's over, it's behind me. We sort of think the medical profession, at least I did, they have all the answers. And then one night out of nowhere, not much later, I had to go back into the ER. And I remember feeling like, oh my God, what's happening? Why am I going back in? What's happening to me? And when I went in a third time, that's when I started to get really frightened. I started to be really afraid and I started to have this sense of despair sweeping over me. And I could tell by the doctor's faces that they didn't really know what was going on and you know if I was going to be okay. And I just had this feeling of sort of hopelessness coming over me. And I had a really good friend and she came to see me in the hospital and she looked at me and she held my hand and she was into alternative methods of healing. And she'd been talking to me about them for a long time, but I was such a skeptic. Hmm. And she said, how many times are you going to go through this before you're willing to change? And, you know, just being in there, being in the ER, her words just like hit home and I can still feel them even today. Hmm. And that's when I think I made this change because I literally willed myself out of the hospital. And I started to explore different ways of healing. And I discovered this amazing Chinese medicine doctor. And I found flower essences. And those two things together started to change my life. And I think when I look back, like what I realized, how important hope is in our lives. Mm. And what this whole thing taught me is not only how important it is, we're never powerless. Mm. We can create change. And that's what made me, you know, do this work because I wanted people to see that no matter what, you're never powerless. You can shift things in your life. You can make your life better. And that's kind of what I feel like I really want to do and help people with. That's the most important thing to me. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, piece. yeah. Yeah, I applaud anyone who is working in healing the world and healing the individuals within the world, because I think that that's the work that needs to be done right now. And I, I like that message of hope, because I think so many people feel hopeless and powerless right now. So yeah. I think that's a key. Yeah, I think that's yeah. A definite and key. it's so much of what we pick up from around us Yeah, you know, to, to lose hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a tough world. <laughs> it's it's a tough and often unforgiving world, right? And so having some hope, I think, is massively helpful. And I think that these are some things, some themes that we'll come back to discuss, but I want to get us there. So let's begin with the core of the book, with our ancestors and ancestral trauma. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that I would probably begin with ancestral trauma. How can we tell? How can someone tell if they are suffering from ancestral trauma? So the trauma exists in the subconscious, but let's see what's happening in like what we may or may not be fully conscious of, but at least mm -hmm. is in the periphery of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. We start to notice things that repeat in our life. Mm. Whether it's in our relationships, whether it's professionally, whether we get the same kind of bosses or the same kind of colleagues, you know, workers, co-workers, or whether we are starting a business and, you know, something is always making it fail. Those are patterns that are repeating in our life. And if we start to look or we start to think, we start to notice that there are patterns that repeated or ran as themes in our family. So that's how the, the past is making its presence felt. I think another way is when you feel like you're doing your best, you're trying to get something off the ground, you're trying to find a relationship, you're trying to you know, have professional success, financial success, and you work really hard at it, but something is out of reach, then that's another sign that you know your ancestral life is, your ancestors are affecting you. And I find like the last one that I find, which I find, which I see when people come to me 
is they are working really hard to repair their family relationships. And they sort of get a little frustrated with it. They find it, they're not understanding why am I the one doing it? Why am I the one making all the effort? But actually, I've come to realize like they are the healers in their family. Mm. They're the ones who've taken on this really sacred task and they don't actually know it. So, you know, I, want, I, want, I hope that those who are listening and who feel like they're the ones who are doing all the effort, like that is an important task that they've taken on. And this is the way in which, you know, all of the stuff from the family lineage, which is unprocessed, is making its presence felt. Because trauma is really the unprocessed story mm. of unresolved emotions, losses, all of that that's making its presence felt for healing, mm. for healing to happen. Yeah, yeah. And that's actually one of the quotes I had from the book is where you wrote that trauma is an unprocessed story. And I thought that that was really very relevant. And I, I can see how it plays kind of in the immediate family dynamics between parents and maybe even grandparents and children. But I'm also really interested about how far back these traumas can go, because I think if anyone stops to think about it, I mean, it's really easy to think about our relationship with our parents and the traumas that may be involved in that. But then you can say, well, okay, yeah. Um, they were also traumatized by their parents and their parents were traumatized by their parents. And it just is this chain. And one of the things I like about this thinking about the roots of trauma in our ancestries and with the ancestors is it, for me, it reminds me that we're all interconnected. You know, we are interconnected to this chain, this ongoing chain that seems like it has to affect us one way or another. Yes. And I think, you know, definitely we don't always know what happened before us because sometimes we might find that there's a parent or a grandparent who doesn't speak about it. Mm, yeah. And so stories get lost. The trauma gets buried. It's not verbalized. It makes its appearance felt in many different ways, but it's not really verbalized. And I would say even for myself, I didn't know my grandfather's. I cannot tell you my parents' history beyond like my grandfather's, my grandparents. I have snippets of it, maybe one or two, but very little. So how do we know what the trauma was? And I think we may never find out, but a lot of traditions had a way of dealing with this ancestral trauma, which was by honoring the ancestors. Mm. So you kind of make peace with the past. You don't go searching for it. You don't go looking for it because you don't have access to it. But honoring your ancestors is sort of their way of saying, you know, this is how they were. We can't change them. We sort of accept this is what it is and let go of our expectations of them. Mm. And in our more immediate parents or grandparents who might be more, you know, available, part of the healing it, that happens is kind of just letting go of our expectations of them, mm. that they are going to be flawed. I mean, no right. matter how much I try, I am definitely going to be a flawed mother. Yeah. It, it's just inevitable. Yeah. So it allows me to actually relax and say, yeah. you know, <laughs> they're going to have to fix it, but I cannot be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, you know, just from personal experience, I think that it is so valuable to adopt that kind of position and to stop and think how we may be reflecting and embodying in our lives the traumas of family and the, you know parents and grandparents and i'll give you two examples if you don't mind i'll just kind of rely on my own life here i actually i've got a couple just from the immediate experience of my parents my father was a career army and he had done two terms in vietnam and he never spoke about Vietnam, never talked about it. So I am sure that there's a lot of trauma that was mm -hmm. in, 
bodied there. Mm -hmm. And my father, he passed away about eight years ago. And one of the issues was that his heart wasn't able to beat properly because the pericardium, the sac that the heart, you know, surrounds the heart had calcified. And so since a heart wasn't able to beat properly, he kept filling up with fluids and it took them for, you know, it took the doctors forever to be, oh yeah. Okay. Well, you know, what you have to, what we have to do is we have to remove that sac so that the heart can be properly. And I've come to realize that, you know, his heart not being able to beat properly, that was trauma. That was the physical manifestation of trauma. Now, what I found really interesting is that now I was mostly raised by my grandparents, but my brother was with my parents and my brother was, my dad was there in his life the whole time. As my dad was getting very sick towards the end of his life, my brother suddenly got sick mm -hmm. and it was similar to what you were talking about. My brother, he kept going to the hospital and when my father had passed away, my brother was in the hospital and they were just doing tests. He was there in the hospital for like 30 days and they were just doing test after test, after test, after test. What was fascinating to me is that although it was very different causes for my brother, I think they said it was some kind of viral infection that he had. He ended up having to have the same operation. Wow. And the surgeon even said, this is not something that's genetic. And I was thinking it may not be genetic, but it's ancestral mm -hmm. because it's manifesting in this same way. Yes, yes, yes. What your father couldn't speak of, mm -hmm. his son, your younger brother, took it on. Yeah. We take that on. Yeah. You know, if you just think about your father's story, there are so many emotions that probably just overwhelmed him and he couldn't like express them and the heart which is really in some ways the organ of sense perception like we see with you know seeing with our heart but then it goes it's like we put it behind bars mm -hmm. because it just cannot deal with everything and how do we soften the heart? How do we allow it to come out? How do we allow the tears to flow? You know, just allow ourselves to express and be vulnerable. And, you know, we we already talked about this earlier, like, you know, the messages from society, emotions are not okay. It's not okay right. to feel, you know, you should have got over it. I mean, Vietnam was so much, so long ago, he should have got over it, but there's no getting over we don't really get over. And then it just, it's the, un, it's the energy of the unresolved emotion. Yeah. And then your brother picks it up. Yeah. And yeah. I hope he's healed and, and okay now, but you know, so much of yeah. it is like <laughs> processing what yeah. couldn't be processed then. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I, I see with him as a father now, and his children are getting older, I can see it also manifesting there. And, you know, I have tried to say, you know, I know that there's a connection between what my father experienced and him. And now I can see it with his children. And my brother, I don't know, is quite open to that yet. And I can say, even though, you know, I always felt that when my father passed away, I felt like we were in a good place. But I also had a very recent experience, not necessarily with health, but the image that came to me was of a cactus and that my heart was this cactus and it had all these barbs around it. And mm -hmm. I understood that, you know, these spines and the barbs were there to protect it, but it also confined it. And mm -hmm. that what my journey is, is to kind of start removing all those, <laughs> those things to allow my heart to grow. And I see that as part of my ancestral work, but it seems to me that, you know, and I don't want to claim any kind of special knowledge here, but that often people don't see these connections. Yeah. How, is there a way to help people make these connections and start in this healing process? 
so I think there's two, three things, you know, given what you've said. One, because trauma is an unprocessed story and we don't want to process. Part of it is making space for our emotions, mm. recognizing that our emotions are key mm. to our healing because, you know, from childhood, we are taught to disconnect from ourselves. Mm. You know, don't don't feel this way. You know, don't feel too much. You're too emotional. You're too sensitive. Get over it. Don't bring your emotions to work. It's like as if everything about our emotions is sort of sort of wrong. Mm. And then the other piece of it is if we allow ourselves to reconnect with ourselves, we have to reconnect with our emotions. Mm. And we have to recognize that the emotions are a sort of portal mm. into healing. And a lot of times, you know, there's a whole spectrum of emotions and the University of Glasgow, they said, you know, look, you have fear, anger, sadness, and joy, the, the four mm. primary emotions. A lot of times we're in those, you know, three of those four right. and we're cycling between those. Mm. So how can we, you know, and, and then we search for joy, we search for mm. happiness, but we have to hear what is the message of disconnection, you know, mm. of those. And the one, you know, that, that really speaks to me is jealousy mm. because, you know, when someone, we say, oh my God, she's so jealous. But when I think about jealousy, it's like there's something perhaps that you want that you can't get. Mm. There's something perhaps that you try to get and you know that that's never going to be part of your life. So there's sadness, there's bitterness, and maybe there's some fear. You know, all of us, at some level, all of us have cactus hearts. <laughs> all yeah. of us do. And we, it's, it's a, you know, the more we connect with ourselves, the more we realize we don't need to search for this outside. I can give myself the compassion. I can give myself the acceptance, the acknowledgement, the validation. And that allows us to open our hearts because we stop expecting it from outside because we can give it to ourselves. So the, the negative emotions are really where we've disconnected from ourselves and the more we reconnect with ourselves, the more we can move into the spectrum of, you know, the peace, the contentment, the harmony, like more of the positive emotions start to enter our lives. The feeling of confidence, mm. trusting ourselves, they start to come back because they were always there. Mm. We just lost them. And, you know, if I can add one more thing that I want to say is that, you know, when trauma happens, what happens is it's not that love is lost. It's the expression of love that is lost. Mm. The softness in the speech with our children, with our partner, the allowing them to be who they are. The, you know, it the expression of love when it gets lost because of fear, insecurity, whatever else, then it shows up as like control. You got to do what I have to do. Like not expressing love. Mm. And that's what gets passed down from one generation to the next is this patterning of how love is expressed mm. yeah yeah i can i can definitely see that so if i understand what you're saying is that with some of these core emotions let's just say anger mm -hmm. if someone has these feelings of anger all the time and you know from personal experience for me it's kind of frustration and I always make a distinction between anger and frustration, although I know that they're closely related. The key would be to go into that, to kind of start investigating that a sense, in a sense, I think, is that how one would then begin the healing process to say, instead of trying to shut the anger down to say, okay, let me explore this. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it is. And, uh, and I think one is the exploration of it. You know, what is it that is causing me to feel this way? And there are so many things because there's so much in our belief system that causes us to feel a certain way. But, you know, this is why I think there's so many tools also that that we are now becoming aware of, of expanding the emotional range. Mm -hmm. And journaling is one of them. You know, daily journaling is like, I feel like one of the cheapest ways of expressing ourselves 
And journaling, journaling allows the emotions to get from the head into paper. And so there's a calming effect there. Taking a walk in nature is another one. Exercising. So those are ways of like shifting the intensity of the emotion. Because think of emotion as energy in motion. Emotion needs a place to go. When it doesn't have a place to go, like to express itself, and I don't mean in a negative way, but you know, if we can reconnect and then transform the way in which we express it, it then becomes a portal into healing. Mm. Because I think a lot of body workers say the issues are in the tissues. Because mm. when it has no place to go, it goes into the body. Mm. Yeah. And, like, and it manifests say, in the body in various mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. 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 And I agree with you that I think Western medicine doesn't quite make that connection. You know, when we look at something that's manifesting in the body, it's always a physical cause, but so often there is an emotional component to it that has to be addressed. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that if it's not, it's just going to keep coming back. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Which is so true. And I remember going for a, a workshop in flower essences right at the start. And there was a, another participant and my arm had been painting and she literally pinpointed. She said, this is the year, this is the name of the person and what happened. And yeah. I'm thinking, no, really? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and she was like, let go. And, and I had to let go of the feelings of resentment mm -hmm. and anger and yeah. sort of allow something different to take its place. And, it, you know, it wasn't easy. And she worked with me and it took several tries. But then I could feel the pain in my arm shift. Mm. So it's really interesting how much of the emotion just settles in the body. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that it reminds me of something that I've recently been going through. And I make a connection to Colorado because it started for me back in 2019. I drove for too long coming back from Colorado and I meander. So I very rarely take direct points on the interstate. I like to get off the roads and I'm usually going through Diné territory and Northern New Mexico and Arizona. And I just kind of wander around in the mountains and in the desert. And I started feeling this pain in the back of my shoulder and in my arm. And I consider Colorado home. And whenever I show up, you know, when you, show up on the interstate, they have the welcome to colorful Colorado sign. And I just start sobbing as soon mm -hmm. as I see that. And when I leave, I'm always kind of like crying for a few days. And what happened was, I'll keep the story really short, is I had been a finalist for a position at a university in Denver where I used to work and I didn't get the job. And two days later, this issue in my back started up again. And I was certain there's a connection. There's a connection there. And it went on for months. And I was seeing an acupuncturist. One of my best friends is a wonderful massage therapist. Mm -hmm. And I started doing yoga every day. So I was getting it healed, but I was at this retreat and one of the facilitators there was also a massage therapist. And she got me on the table. She's like, you're carrying so much tension in your body. And she saw, she found that knot because that's what it was. It just felt like a constellation of knots. And what she did is she's like, oh, well, who's this? I'm like, oh, and I kind of gave her that story. And what she asked me, and this is what you were saying, kind of reminded me of this. She said, well, what's its name? I'm like, well, I never named it. She goes, well, if you don't name it, if it doesn't have a name, how can you ask it to leave? Wow. So I actually named it and I have a very specific name for this. <laughs> and I started like, you know, get out, <laughs> you know, go in peace, go in compassion, but get out. And it worked. It's gone. Wow. Well, oh, I love that yeah. story. I love yeah. that story. Yeah. 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 So. I, I, so the body is the unconscious mind, right? Yeah. And, you yeah. know, we think we are operating consciously and there's our body. And if we were to think of our subconscious, who knows what kind of big, huge uh, monster fully yeah. formed is roaming, wreaking yeah. havoc. And yeah. we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and something else I wanted to ask you about here is that these 
because I do want to ask you about the family constellation therapy, and we'll talk a little bit about the flower essences as well. But something that you write is that the family is an energy field. And I really liked that idea because again, it is an expansion from the sort of Western medical model of things. And it's, you know, yes, there's the bodily aspect, there's the genetic aspect with families, but it, it I, families have a collected energy. Why it came to my mind when reading this was the work of Rupert Sheldrake, where he talks about morphogenetic fields. And mm -hmm. that's the way I was thinking about it. It's like, yeah, that makes sense that a family lineage is going to accrue a kind of energy, an energy field that we are all embedded in. Am I getting that right? Yes, yes, yes. And so, you know, we are trained to think nuclear family, parents, grandparents, but it's like we have other family members who affect us. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I also discovered when I was doing learning or studying this ancestral healing work that our family, you know, it, it includes those whom we've harmed, those who have harmed us. It's like mm -hmm. bigger than we feel. Yeah, it, it is, you know, intellectually, we think this is it, but no, it's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and I, I can see how that plays out in a variety of ways. I'll come back to that. I don't want to take up all the time talking about my family. No, but, but... I just want to say, actually, <laughs> you know what, interestingly, Nick, because so when you talk about like your father and being in the mm -hmm. war, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like when we think of an expanded family it's like we just light a candle to honor all those who fought yeah, yeah, more. You know, yeah. his his own like colleagues, you know, other mm -hmm. people, the other nation, the other. It's like all of them light a, you know, lighting a candle for compassion and grace for everybody in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that sort of shifts the energy. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I have an ancestor altar that I've set up. And so I have pictures of some immediate family, but I have my family, especially on my father's side, all the way back to 1635. Wow. Um, because we've been in the colonies <laughs> a very, very long time. And the Mathers were one of the most influential Puritan families in the early colonies. And a lot of people know their history, actually the Boston area, that's where they were. Mm -hmm. So two of them were indirectly involved with the Salem witchcraft trials. Mm -hmm. One of them, Cotton Mather, actually wrote a book that has been suggested was the spark <laughs> that sort of lit the flame for it. And I also see, and this is something that I see on a national level. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just share this. I always thought that since they were Puritans, mm -hmm. that maybe my family was somehow at least originally kind of free of the sin of slavery. Mm -hmm. Then I read that Cotton Mather became very interested in inoculations against smallpox because he saw an, his African slave um, mm -hmm. use this. I'm like, Oh damn it. <laughs> um, and then I discovered that the family patriarch was Richard Mather, mm -hmm. and he was the first person to convert an African slave to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that created this huge controversy mm -hmm. about, well, can you actually hold a Christian as a slave? Mm -hmm. And it was his grandson, Cotton, that answered it. And he's like, yes. Yes. And by all means, you should convert your African slaves to Christianity because it's going to pacify them. Mm. And they're going to be less likely to run away and they're going to be less likely to slice your throat in the middle of the night. Mm. And so I saw this and I'm like, oh, wow, my family had a huge role in this collective trauma of slavery. And I feel that it's important to acknowledge that 
And I had an interaction with someone recently where I kind of pointed this out because they referred to Cotton Mather as a great man who experimented with inoculations. And I kind of pointed out, it's like, oh, you mean what he learned from his slave? And they said to me, the response was, well, it's really easy for us to start feeling superior with these slaveholders and whatnot, you know? And I'm like, well, yeah, there is a point that what we think is moral and right and good, you know, future generations may be like, what in the world were they thinking? I get that. But my response was, but yet when you were telling the story about him and the inoculations, you left the slave out. <laughs> that just perpetuates a different kind of supremacy and one that I don't want to perpetuate. So I see ancestral healing as being relevant not just for me on a personal level with my family, but also collectively at a national level. And I would imagine that everybody has to deal with these sorts of things in some way or another. Yeah. I think everybody has to, because no family is without what's happened before. No mm. family is without its share of secrets. And you know, in seven generations, 1635 is, I don't even know how many generations, but in About seven, nine or 10. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. in seven generations, we have like 252 mothers and fathers. Wow. So in 20 generations, we have about a million. Wow. So imagine when we're born, like 256 chapters have passed hmm. nine or 10 generations is like so many more. Yeah. And there's nothing that we can do to change that. Hmm. There's nothing that we can do to fix what happened, but we can only stand in the present mm -hmm. and shift how we see the world. Yeah. And, you know, lots of acts of compassion, of generosity are, are similar across all traditions because mm -hmm. that's a form of healing in the present. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, if you just think about all the ancestral stories that you shared and you think of what you're doing today, pointing out similarities across religions, pointing mm -hmm. out like teaching comparative religions, like exploring myths, you know, you drive through areas where the DNA was like, you know, look mm -hmm. at what, you know, how far you are from, mm -hmm. from, you know, 1635 and what right. came after. In some ways, this is how the ancestral field is wanting healing to happen. Mm. This is how, because, it, and in a lot of traditions, it's believed like our ancestors' souls, like, in, you know, including our souls when we die, because one day we will be the ancestors. We need to evolve and their evolution, they want to make amends. But they cannot make amends. They can only do it through us. Right. So we are the ones who they want or hope will make the amends. And that's why their energy sort of circulates around us and, you know, shows yeah. up in different ways because that's how we start to access or enter the portal of healing. Yeah. And so in many ways, you know, you are kind of, even if you didn't consciously <laughs> tune it, you are doing the healing work. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I always say is that that's what I'm engaged in is I'm doing, you know, ancestral healing. And and I have, you know, with the first sort of three major patriarchs in the family, it's easy to get pictures of them. So I actually have pictures of them in my altar when I don't disregard them. I thank them for what they did and their sacrifices. And I know that they're imperfect, but I know that I'm imperfect as well. So, yeah. that, you know, it just seems to me that it's only by acknowledging the imperfections rather than perpetuating these stories of you know, great men and, you know, sometimes great women, but we still leave them out <laughs> more often than not, but that just recognizing the imperfections is one of the things that we have to do in terms of that healing, which is what you said before. I want to ask you, you know, I've talked about my ancestral altar and that's something that you recommend. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more. What's the importance of creating a altar to the ancestor and making offerings to our ancestors? So in, so in the in Indian tradition, a lot of homes have altars, but we don't call them ancestral altars. It's just altars, actually. 
and they become, I, I never fully understood what was the purpose of it, but it becomes a place in the home where you anchor the energy of a home. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, you, in a lot of homes, they'll light a candle at the altar in the morning and in the evening. Um, and so it becomes a place where you stop, you express your frustration, you express your sorrow, you express your gratitude, you ask for blessings for a new venture, you ask for blessings for your family, for your children, you pray for someone who's sick, you know, like it happens all over the world. But in the Indian context, we kind of have that altar at home. An ancestral altar, when I have not, don't have it in my house, I, you know, sometimes people will put a picture of somebody who's been who's passed on but if you go to a lot of stores in india you'll see that they have pictures of the of you know the the parents it can be husband wife grandparents and in the morning they're garlanded they have the incense the flowers so they you know in some ways that's like ancestral altar mm. but alberto violdo who is this cuban medical anthropologist he said you know these altars existed everywhere. And in South America, where they existed, they were a way to anchor the ancestral energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you knew where your ancestors were, you kind of knew where that energy was. So it was, mm -hmm. it was a way of anchoring. He said, if you, it, it's a way of, if you don't know where they are, then they're running amok, ruining your life. <laughs> so it's better to know where they are. And I think that is really important, mm -hmm. you know, because, I have photographs of, you know, my father who's passed on and, you know, my grandparents, but not on my altar. But, mm. you know, there are certain times of the year when I will put that in my altar mm. and I will pray for, you know, my father to be well, to be, you know, in whatever realm. And I think this is the other important distinction that, you know, it's assumed in a lot of Native traditions, Indigenous traditions, that you're praying for your, to your ancestors but you're not praying to them. You're praying for them, mm -hmm. for them to be in a, you know, in a better place. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. distinction then allows them to be much more, you know, to evolve and to be more helpful to us. Yeah. 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 I like that. And I like the idea of working with the ancestors because I think a lot of times people feel that it seems to me that if the family is an energetic field, then mm -hmm. the energy of the ancestors are still there and we can work with that energy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, family constellation work does that a lot. That's what family mm -hmm. constellation work does. Okay. It, it assumes that you can call on that energy of the ancestors mm -hmm. when you're struggling with an issue mm -hmm. and the energy becomes present to give you an insight into what is it that you're struggling with. And people represent your family members. They just step in. It's, you know, everyone in a family constellation is sitting in a circle and the the space in the middle is empty. And the person who, the client who's asking for, you know, an insight into their situation will call on family, on members sitting in the circle to represent their family members. And as soon as they step into the circle, they take on the energy of that family member. And you can be like, I don't believe in this. You know, I don't, I'm not into any kind of this work, but it's just unbelievable how you start to feel what they might have felt. Your whole body, the way you stand, sit, your posture, everything starts to shift. Hmm. And so it sort of gives an insight into that situation that could have caused your current situation. Okay. So I just want to clarify for the listeners and viewers you just gave a really good example of how family constellation therapy works. But what I want to do is kind of say what it is, what is family constellation therapy? And maybe the answer was already embedded there in what you just said, but I just, I just want to be a little, you know, I'm still a little bit of an academic, so I want to get the definitions clear. Is it just recognizing the way that these family energies affect the individual and then attempting to identify them? Or what am I missing? How would you define family constellation therapy? So 
it's hard it's hard to define it okay. it's easier to almost explain it which is okay. kind of what i was just doing okay all right um, and what it is is it allows people a window it's a form of energy work mm. so through that energy work you are given a window into a slice of your family history that that is affecting you today mm. and that's really what it is and that's what family constellation therapy is it's called therapy but it's really a form of yeah. energy work okay and right. until you've experienced it it's really hard to to actually visualize it mm. but i would say for your listeners there is a turkish netflix series called another self Hmm. And it's actually, they have it structured as a story, but it is, it is about uh, a woman who starts to do family constellation work to heal herself. Hmm. Interesting. I don't think they ever call it a family constellation in the, in the, hmm. in the series. Okay. But, uh, yeah. All right. That's, All it right. is a, you can sort of see that in, in the series. Yeah. You gave a really interesting example in your book of a client and it was really about a client's son and it was something I'm trying to remember here that the son had issues with things around his neck mm. and it turned out the way you described the story and i'll ask you to kind of expand upon it that he was reliving it seems the trauma for him it would have been like a great great uncle yeah that he yeah. knew nothing about yeah who yeah. was hanged. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Could you maybe share that story a bit? Yeah. It was the, the client who came to me, his great uncle had been hung and his son was experiencing these symptoms of not being able to, you know, pull anything up. Like, I mean, I'm wearing a turtleneck. He couldn't wear a turtleneck. Mm -hmm. He couldn't pull a zipper up all the way up to the top. And I didn't write this in the book, but he, he felt like hands would come to like choke. Hmm. He had the sensation of like something pressing on his neck hmm. and he couldn't, you know, he, he, the child didn't know why this was the case, but just didn't want to like have anything around his neck. And then when the father talked about it, then we talked about just honoring remembering you know this great uncle mm. and uh, it started to help the boy mm. and he could actually you know pull a zipper up that was the interesting thing to me <laughs> you know yeah. he could pull the zipper up yeah now when i read that the note that i made in the book i, I wrote all over your book by the way was reincarnation because that's the first thing that came into my mind is that well maybe the great great uncle has reincarnated into the family uh, you know it's a possibility and i yeah. i don't really go into reincarnation right. but see if we all are reborn in the same family energy field because mm. we have come to heal that means it's possible we were once the ancestors yeah right the yeah. ones who now we're coming in to make reparations to make amends mm. we don't really know that yeah well, it seems like it would be consistent with the idea of a family energy field, mm -hmm. you know, that it's not necessarily something that would be other, but that it's yeah possible and consistent. And again, yeah, you know, we don't know. <laughs> but, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, once you start doing the work, it's interesting how much information starts to come. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I also liked how you had, you said that when you start doing the work and start healing that like synchronicities will start occurring to sort of let you know that you are on the right path, that healing is happening. Yes, absolutely true. I was running a workshop a few weeks ago and there was this, this, this woman, I mean, she, you could see she just had this lovely soul and she kept saying, you know, I'm crazy. You know, my family says I'm crazy. And, and it turns out that, yes, yeah, she had gone through a lot, but she had, you know, gone back to her church, however she chooses to practice her faith. Mm -hmm. And she had reconnected with her mother's sister. She had reconnected with some cousins. 
And she had gotten a photograph of her father who had died when she was very young. So, you know, these little things, you don't actually notice them. But when you start to see that this is something coming from the family energy field, then it really takes on a lot more meaning because it means you're on the right track. You're doing the right work. No matter if anybody is telling you, oh, you're crazy, you're this, you're that. Uh uh. It's that's not, you know, that's not true. Because yeah. you are doing the work and this is the healing and reclaiming your power is I'm not crazy. Yeah. I am doing this work and these are the signs that I'm on the right track. Mm. So along these lines with, you know, these synchronicities and the family emotional field and energy field, it seems like there may be as well a connection and you do address this. And I actually like what you wrote, but I want to ask you about this, that there is an aspect of karma that's at play in all of this. But what I liked is that you, you make the argument that karma is not passive, that too many people have this idea that karma is something that happens to them and there's no escape from it, but you don't take that approach. So could you speak a little bit towards karma and these energetic fields and how we can not be victims of our karma? Yeah. You know, there's an African proverb that says, which I really love. It says, when you cut your chains, you free yourself. Mm. And when you cut your roots, you die. Mm. And I think what it really means is karma is, you know, whatever is happening. We free ourselves when we let go of the conditioning, we let go of our expectations, our, you know, our beliefs that this is right, this is wrong, like all of that, which is conditioning, how things should be. And when we start to reclaim our power, then we're no longer victims of what happened before. And that's really what healing is. Ancestral healing is really letting go of the feeling that you're a victim of what came before. And in family constellation work, they say only an adult can leave the family of origin. And what we really mean is an adult is someone who has taken responsibility for his or her life, for their life. They can leave the family of origin. So anytime you let go of victimhood, you're actually free. You need to do nothing. Mm. You're free. You don't even need to do any work with the ancestral because the past cast does, does not cast a shadow on you. Mm. You're free of everything. Mm. Yeah, I like that. And so much of what you say, I appreciate because it's it gives the individual agency mm-hmm. and there's a responsibility for self-reflection and self-examination. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and I, I honestly do feel like even if karma is, you know, exists in so many religious traditions and, you know, we, the, that you sow what you reap, but there is infinite grace Mm -hmm. and it shows itself up in these synchronicities Mm -hmm. in little synchronicities. And that's when you know that, you know, you're also being taken care of. Yeah. In the hardest moments, there is still a ray of hope, a ray of grace that is making presence felt. We just are not trained to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming back to the hope. I like that. I like that combination of karma and grace and and the importance of hope uh, and the connection with power, because that's what we need. We need to feel our power, feel, you know, I, I typically kind of express it as our creativity Mm -hmm. Uh, but i think it's maybe it's the same thing our power and our creativity because i think that's what we're meant to do is to be creators you know yes yeah 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 Yeah. so so our our root chakra is our relationship with the you know with our family of origin Mm -hmm. including other things and our sense of safety and security and whatever is unresolved there makes its presence felt in the sacral chakra, which is the seat of our creativity as well. Mm -hmm. So our creativity can get blocked or stifled, but you know, it's fully unleashing it Mm -hmm. when you also release all of the entanglements from the root chakra. 
Okay. It's a journey. It's not like it happens yeah. overnight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everything takes work, you know, and I think it's the commitment to do the work, you know, the commitment to do the work. But along these lines of the healing and, and the chakras and whatnot, I wanted to ask you about the flower essences, because that's also a major component in, in your book. And I was wondering if you could explain to the audience what the flower essences are and how they can help in this healing process. Ultimately, healing cannot happen intellectually. No matter how much I might want to rationalize, you know, anybody's behavior in my family, whether it's my spouse, my kid, my parents, grandparents, anybody, at the end of the day, it cannot be an intellectual process. It has to be from the heart, that softening of the heart, the emergence of compassion for somebody else's story, as well as for myself. And that I feel happens through flower essences because the essences are really medicine from mother nature directly. And for thousands of years, you know, dew has been considered to have healing properties, you know, with the ancient Egyptians and a lot of traditions. And there was a British surgeon in the 1930s, and he found a way to recreate the healing properties of dew, as well as to stabilize it. So flower essences are really wildflower infusions in spring water and they're preserved with brandy. So that's really what they are. Their steam, essential oils are through a steam distillation process and you know other things, but flower essences are just the energetic property of the flower. And you know we talked about emotions, like so if you take the primary emotion like fear, what Dr. Bach did is he identified several different kinds of fear. Mm. So the flower essences, you know, target all the different kinds of fear, you know, that paralyzing fear, the fear of like insects, the fear of flying or something you can speak about, the fear you can't speak about, the fear for your loved ones, you know? So there's different kinds of fear. And so the flower essences act on the nuanced energy of those emotions because those emotions reside in the body and they reside in our energy field. So the flower essences lift and shift the, the thoughts that are causing those emotions. And, you know, you can see your response change after taking it for a while. Yeah. So they work on a vibrational level then? They work on a vibrational level. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, it was recommended to me back in November <laughs> uh, <laughs> to, uh, the way it was expressed, was, it, there was a recommendation to work with flower essences. But they, the person also said plant medicines. So I actually have, I'm not going to show the label, but I actually have here some <laughs> flower essences. I haven't taken them for about a month now because I ended up doing a different kind of plant medicine regime. And I wanted to just allow that to work without any interference. But as soon as I can, I'm going to try these again, you know, because my approach is, you know, I don't know, but you know, there's no harm in trying <laughs> and wow. seeing what happens, right? Yeah. Flower essences have no side effects. Yeah. They can be taken with other medications because they're just vibrational. Yeah, yeah. So in that sense, they are very safe, non-toxic, uh, and they work very gently. Mm -hmm. And they're designed to restore, you know, our connection to ourselves. So restore that sense of internal guidance that trusting of ourselves. Mm. Yeah. And these are readily available at like some health food stores. And I, I would yeah. imagine, yeah. A lot of health food stores carry them. Whole Foods carries them to some extent, not the whole range. They carry a few of them. And although Dr. Bach's essences were like the first to be discovered in the 1930s, now there are a lot more different, mm. like, you know, essences. Yeah. But those are the foundational essences, okay. which I find actually work really well to start with. Mm. And then there are also others that, you know, can build off of those, like go into the more subtle nuances. Mm. But I find that those are, they do a lot 
yeah. um, as a set of foundational essences, they are capable of doing a lot of mm. creating a lot of transformation. Yeah. And you include a lot of the essences in, in your book and what, how they can help and what they can be used for. So yeah. just for anyone who's not familiar, these are things that you would put like drops in some just basic water and sip the water throughout yes. the day, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Four drops, four times a day, you know, once when you wake up, once before bed and twice in between. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. And I think for the twice in between, a lot of times, you know, I would just put it in a water bottle or something. So then I don't have to think about it yeah, and yeah. I get the doses during the day. Yeah. Yeah. I think I did mine wrong. I was doing 16 drops all at once. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so maybe I need to spread them out. I suppose. Yeah, it's a kind, it, because it's a frequency vibrational medicine, you need to yeah. take it at least four times a day. More okay. is fine. It doesn't right, have an right. issue, but at least four. Okay. Well, it's probably good then that I took a break so that I could speak with you and get that correction. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll finish the bottle I have and see what happens, but I need to wait still another week or two because I want to allow the vibration of the other plant medicine to fully work its magic on me. Yes. So, so Let me know that. when you start them and how you feel after that. Yeah, yeah, I will. I will. So I think that this leaves us in a pretty good place. I like your message of hope and power. And is there anything I'm missing or any recommendation that you would give to someone who feels like maybe they need to start investigating their family, their ancestors, and the role it may be playing in their lives and their unhappiness because the goal here is to be joyful and to be happy. So what, what would you recommend for someone to start in this inquiry? I think if you just simply start with where you are, because you can only start where you are. Yeah. So if there is something that is <clears throat> really upsetting you, you know, what is it? Is it uh, something to do with work? Is it something to do with a relationship? And then look and see, is there a pattern mm. in your life with regard to the work, the relationship? And what do you think the pattern is telling you? What are the emotions that are coming up? Yeah. And that's a good place to start. Yeah. And if you have access to it, you can look at, you know, either, either side, it might be one side. So either the mother, maternal lineage or the paternal lineage for, you know, where are these emotions showing up? Where are these patterns showing up? And that's a clue. That's a starting point. That's a clue. And then those are the emotions. If you can start to identify them, those are the emotions you want to shift. Mm. And an ancestral altar is a good place to do it, to just create an ancestral altar. In the book, I do offer like a, a very simple prayer that anyone can do, which is a non-religious prayer and people can adapt it. That's also a way of bringing the ancestral energy into a place of peace. But these are just ways of like calming the energy field. And ultimately, you know, drawing on the energy of mother, mother, mother nature, because mm. earth is like really the true mother, the mother of all mothers, the mother of all fathers. Yeah. Right. And we forget that she's the one who really nurtures us. Yeah. So just being out in nature is also like the more we ground with the nature's energy and receive that mothering energy, the more we can sort of start to enter that space of connection yeah. and belonging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I advocate for that all the time. Go out into nature. And in the prayer that I do, I also do a prayer, not just for my ancestors, I always kind of phrase it named and unnamed because there are so many that we don't know, but also ancestors of land and ancestors of place, which I think gets into the mother nature and the connection to the land, I think. And then I also, my human and non-human ancestors, which I think gives me a connection in that recognition that everything is my ancestor. Well, that is so beautiful. Yes, because you know, we belong when we start to recognize that this is all, that we are connected to all of this yeah. around us. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I have, I have some of my <laughs> former kitties in my, in my ancestor mm-hmm. altar, <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah, they're kin too. They're kin too. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 All right. Well, Anu, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. It's been an absolute delight. And I do recommend that people pick up a copy of your book. I think there's a lot of good wisdom and guidance in it and that people will really find it helpful. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, and that's a wrap on episode 79 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you're part of my YouTube audience or view this on Spotify. If you like what I do here on Rebel Spirit Radio and would like to support my work, then please consider becoming a patron. You can find the link for the Patreon in the show notes or video description. And of course, if you'd rather uh, make a one-time donation, you can still do so via PayPal. I will be tremendously grateful for any support you can provide. And another way that you can help the podcast is to share it with your friends, family members, coworkers, anyone that you think would be interested in what I'm doing here. And also please share it on social media as well. That really is one of the best ways that you can help support the podcast. So if you feel moved by the rebel spirit, and I hope that you do, um, please help me share the good news. Also, if you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. And please subscribe. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to or watching Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.